from your name, right? And he is actually the cousin of one of our most faithful attendees, Terry. And Terry suggested about Greg and Greg, we were very ecstatic. Um, Greg has retired from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service where he worked in the Delaware River watershed. He, he, he primarily, primarily focused on red knot monitoring, monitoring and horseshoe crab management. And he still continues to volunteer as a shorebird monitor. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we're gonna let Greg share his screen. And we're very excited to have him join us at this time. Well, thank you very much for <clears throat> having me. Um, it's a subject, as you mentioned, that I've been involved with for <clears throat> quite a few years, and I'm always happy to talk about it. <clears throat> uh, you, of course, down in Florida get to see red knots potentially all year round. We only get to see them up in Delaware and New Jersey uh, in the spring in May, but they come to Delaware Bay because of Delaware Bay's characteristics, particularly the horseshoe crabs. Um, I know you mentioned to people that they could ask questions in the chat and uh, you'll, uh, you'll relay them to me at the end and, and that's great. Um, but if there are some clarification questions, I don't mind if they come in earlier than that. So whoever's monitoring the chat, if it's something that would be better addressed right away, please let me know. And um, with that, let me uh, get started. <clears throat> and I'll start um, with Delaware Bay and horseshoe crabs. And Delaware Bay has been known as a unique place for quite a few years. We have records back in the 1800s talking about the amazing amount of horseshoe crabs at Delaware Bay. And not just the amazing amount of crabs, but the amazing amount of horse of their eggs up on the surface of the bay. Um, we have records, for example, of people being able to just use a shovel and collect as many eggs as they needed in wagons to take for whatever use they would put them to, I imagine feed or fertilizer. Um, we've also, I, we uncovered a record of um, a, a a load of sand having to be discarded because it had so many horseshoe crab eggs, it couldn't be used to make concrete. So that's a serious amount of eggs back then. The um, first uh, exploitation on an industrial scale for horseshoe crabs in Delaware Bay was the fertilizer industry. And uh, I guess it's not surprising that if there's a abundant resource, man will figure out a way to make use of it. And so on both sides of the Delaware Bay in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, there were companies that were collecting horseshoe crabs, which it turns out is pretty easy because all they had to do was build a fence perpendicular to the shore and wait for low tide. And the horseshoe crabs that were spawning would get confused by the fence and, and they don't worry if, if they can't quite figure out how to get back into deeper water, they just hunker down and wait till the next tide. Well, then people could take wagons down and fill up their wagons and bring them up to these bins that you see and pile them in there where they would die and then they would dry out. And then they would take the dried bodies back to the factory where they grind them up and put them in bags and sell them for fertilizer. And apparently that was an eagerly sought after fertilizer for quite a few years. There are records that uh, people were concerned that the harvest was not sustainable and that the numbers of horseshoe crabs were declining. Um, and the records from the companies themselves indicate that four to five million crabs were harvested each year, which is a large number of crabs. Um, at any rate, the, uh, the fertilizer industry did peter out and it petered out by the mid 1900s. And there's, there's several reasons why that could have been. It could have been over harvest and then just not abundant enough resource to make it worthwhile. There's also uh, some people who feel that the tourist industry, so Cape May and Cape Henlopen in Delaware were developing their tourist summer tourist industries. Well, piles of dead crabs stink to high heavens. So um, they, there's some thought that maybe they put pressure on the companies to 
cease and desist. The, the third thing that people often bring up is that modern fertilizers came online somewhere around the early to mid 1900s, which is just about the time when this industry faded away. And it may be that modern fertilizers were cheaper and more effective um, and that may have been the demise of the industry as well, or all, a combination of all three, perhaps, perhaps. At any rate, we don't have a lot of in the historical record about large numbers of crabs in Delaware Bay for about 20 or so years until we get into the 70s. Um, and I'll get to that in a, in a couple slides. But hey, Greg. the next thing, yes? Oh. Um, Terry was just bringing up that if you hit the view button and hit slideshow, you'll get rid of all the other stuff on your the screen. Ah, uh, the view button. The view button over to your left. I think it's over. Whoops, it's on the regular bar. You mean on my? Uh... I think that's it right there. Try that. Uh, probably, oh, maybe not. Yeah, it's, let know. me check here. I'll have to get out of the, okay, give me a second. Let me get out of there and let me check the slideshow settings. I had it set for in a window because when I did full screen, oh. part of the slides were being um, clipped by the Zoom. So, but I can try switching it back if you want. And you let me know if that works. Otherwise I'll go back to the other way I was doing okay. it. Um, how does that look for everyone? I think it looks good. Looks good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, cool. we'll Thank go like you. that. If <laughs> if it starts clipping off the right side, which was the problem I was having, let me know and I'll switch back to the other mode. Okay. Uh, so there wasn't a lot in the historic record until the 70s, uh, which I'll get to in a little bit, but um, but it's it's some people have wondered if the population recovered over that 20 year time period. What we do know is that certainly scientists were studying the horseshoe crab. In fact, it's one of the most studied marine organisms in the world. And uh, a lot of what we know about our optic nerves was learned by horseshoe crabs because for whatever reason, they have an unusually large optic nerve. The um, but in the 70s, some researchers found out that their immune system was really sensitive to bacteria. <clears throat> and they worked out a way to take some of the blood from horseshoe crabs and extract from that components of their immune system that would be highly reactive to bacteria. And that test uh, took, the, took over from the test that they called the rabbit test back then, where they would take a get a little bit of solution and inject it into a rabbit and hope that the rabbit had a fever and there were a lot of positive false positives and false negatives and it took several days to find out if your sample was contaminated or not whereas the test derived from horseshoe crab blood happened in minutes and it had fewer false positives and fewer false negatives and this has since the 70s become the worldwide standard for testing anything that goes into your body <clears throat> from pacemakers to artificial joints to flu shots to COVID vaccinations, anything that potentially could introduce bacteria is has at least a subsample of that tested using this test. In recent years, one company has used genetic tools to recreate part of the immune system um, in another organism that's easy to grow in the lab, and they've started using what they call that recombinant test but most companies are still relying on the horseshoe crab test. Now that test, to get that test, they collect crabs, but then they only take a portion of the blood and then they return the crabs to the water. So it doesn't cause 100% mortality, something more like 15% mortality. So it doesn't have a huge impact on the population, hopefully. But then in the 90s, uh, the watermen up and down the East Coast realized that there was a market that they could exploit for sea snails, for conch or whelk. Um, and uh, the best bait for catching conch and whelk apparently is horseshoe crabs. Uh, the watermen have tried lots of different things, but they always go back to horseshoe crabs. 
So all of a sudden in the 90s, this big fishing industry to collect horseshoe crabs to use as bait to catch conch started up. And it was unregulated as well as the conch fishery was unregulated. And all of a sudden people started getting worried that the impact to the horseshoe crabs would be so great that it might impact uh, the shorebirds. And the reason for that has to do with some of the natural history of horseshoe crabs. So let me go over a little bit of that for you. Uh, they, they live, of course, in the bottom of the ocean. They feed on worms and shellfish, and we don't typically see them except when they're spawning or if there's a dead shell that washed up onto the beach. Um, but during spawning, they come up to the edge of the, the surf, the swash zone often called. And uh, in Delaware Bay, it looks like this. If you go outside of Delaware Bay, you'll see a clump here and a clump there and a lot of sand in between. But in Delaware Bay, you just have a, a, a continuous line of crabs milling around and spawning. They come on shore uh, from April into July, and each female lays about 80,000 eggs over several tide cycles in several clusters uh, each cluster having a few thousand eggs. And they bury them fairly deep, say uh, two to 12 inches. And so they wouldn't normally be accessible to the birds. However, in Delaware Bay, with our super abundance of crabs, between wave action and successive waves of horseshoe crabs digging into the sand to lay their own eggs, a lot of eggs are brought to the surface. In fact, the majority of eggs are probably brought to the surface and don't contribute to the population of young crabs. Uh, the cra horseshoe crabs live about 20 years, which is a pretty long time for an invertebrate and um, means that if you have an overharvest situation, it could take a long time for them to recover. They don't breed until nine to 12 years with males reaching breeding age a little sooner than females. Um, so again, a long pause before you ever find out if whatever you did for management had an effect and you have more crabs. Um, so it makes it a species that's pretty susceptible to over harvest. This is a cluster. So that would be a one, one cluster that was laid by a female. I found that on the surface because it had gotten dug up by a succeeding wave of spawning crabs and wave action. But that gives you an idea of what several thousand horseshoe crab eggs look like after they've been laid in the sand. Now, prior to the 70s, we don't have a lot of information on red knots. The information we do have talks mostly about them outside of Delaware Bay, interestingly, although there was at least one letter that was found in the historical record that talked about large numbers of red knots in Delaware Bay. But most of the information seems to be about Cape Cod to Virginia um, by hunters who were apparently very happy to get red knots and so would often shoot at least a couple at every time they went out. And some records with talking about immense numbers of these birds, again, not in Delaware Bay, but all up and down the coast, including uh, market hunters who were ca capturing the bird or catching the birds, killing the birds, and to sending them into market with one record talking about six barrels of birds on the deck of a ship going to Boston. And in at least in the 1893 observations on the knot by McKay, they were, to, they were concerned about them being reduced in numbers and in danger of extinction, which suspiciously is about when the fertilizer industry was going uh, gangbusters. So it, uh, it suggests that perhaps there was a over harvesting of crabs and the impact on the birds was for their population to decline, but we only have that tenuous idea from those records. In the 1970s is when our records about horseshoe crab, about red knots and horseshoe crabs in the bay really start to, to uh, come to the fore uh, because the New Jersey Audubon Society began talking about it and uh, inviting people to come and see this great uh, spectacle that they could see in May at, in Delaware Bay, um, which has been likened to what you could see with the wildebeest migration in the Serengeti. It really is a world-class event. Um, and so they, they publicized it, but then, then of course, once the horseshoe crabs um, uh, fishery started to develop, then they also got concerned about 
whether the bird numbers would decline. And there was some concern and, and apparently the bird numbers were declining as were horseshoe crab numbers, it seemed. So that started a lot of uh, concern. And one of the concerns with red knots was they are one of the ultimate birds for long distance migration. They uh, winter down in the tip of South America in Tierra del Fuego, and they fly up to the high Arctic where they breed. And they have very long hops between stopovers. In other words, they fly like an ultra marathon runner would run and then stop at an area where they can get a lot of food quickly. Interestingly, we don't really know what the juveniles are doing and how well their wintering area is because we just don't know very well where the juveniles winter. They winter somewhere where the adults do not. And red knots don't breed until they're two years old. So we, we have this big gap in our knowledge. We also don't have a lot of information about their red knots productivity in the high Arctic simply because logistically it's very, very difficult to get out there and sample enough nests um, to really get a handle on that. Uh, the birds are estimated to nest one nest every square mile to give you some idea of how much time you'd have to spend. Um, the other interesting thing is about red knots is they're a highly specialized feeder. They feed exclusively on um, bivalves, on clams, uh, small mollusks, except in Delaware Bay. And I'll get back to that in just a minute. This one thing we, we have done is confirmed that they do have really long flights between stopovers. The device you see on the leg of a red knot is called a geolocator. Basically, it's a data logger. And this little device is light enough to put on their leg and not impede their migration. The only trick with it is you have to catch the bird a second time, and that's quite a difficult trick. But what it does is it keeps track of time and it measures light. Now, if you think about that for a little bit, if I know when the sun comes up, when the light starts getting bright, I've got an approximate east-west location on the planet Earth. And if I know how long the day is, i.e. how many hours it was bright and, and light, then I have an approximate north-south location. So they act as a little uh, GPS, if you will. And this was a bird that was caught in Delaware Bay. One of these geolocators was put on its leg. It went on up to the Arctic. You can see the points one, two, three, four. And then it came back down to the Caribbean at point six, and then to northern Brazil, point seven, and then down to southern Brazil, and then finally down into the southern part of Argentina at point nine and then came back to Delaware Bay at point 11 and was re we were lucky enough to recapture it. Well, from the southern tip of a uh, southern portion of Brazil, point 10 to point 11 in Delaware Bay, as far as we know, it flew nonstop, almost 5,000 miles, and it took six days to get there. I'll also point you out, point out that the leg from point five to point six from the Arctic to the Caribbean was only 3,000 miles, but apparently took the bird eight days. So um, when they reach Delaware Bay, frequently we find that they are below, at or below fat-free weight. They've used up all their body resources, all their fuel to get to Delaware Bay, and they need to have food fast. And in Delaware Bay, despite a lot of scientists looking for alternative sources, the only source that seems to have enough uh, capacity for the birds is horseshoe crab eggs. And yet people were seeing eggs that looked like they hadn't gotten digested in the bird's poop. And early studies of, with caged birds feeding them only eggs seemed to indicate that they weren't able to digest the eggs. What it, it took a USGS scientist with caged birds with a sandy bottom in the cage to confirm that they could gain weight on a diet of nothing but eggs in a cage just as well as they could out in the wild. And the secret was the sand. The uh, red knots have a strong muscular stomach, but sort of like a gizzard, they need to have some grit in there so they can slice open the, the shell of the egg. Now the shell is sort of rubbery, so once they slice it open and squeeze out the contents, it bounces back up and it fills up with fluid. And so in their poop, it looks like 
an intact egg that was never digested, but they did digest it. They do gain weight. And they also used radioisotope to show analysis to show that the, the, the signature in the eggs was very similar to the signature in their bodies when they ate it. And also came up with a hypothesis that the eggs are especially easy to assimilate and it takes less digestive energy than for something like a uh, clam. So these birds can put on weight in Delaware Bay at an astounding rate. And uh, the best way to give you an idea of how fast that is would be to give you the human equivalent. So it would be like us gaining eight pounds a day for two weeks, gaining 112 pounds in two weeks. It's, I hope that doesn't happen to me. This is a picture I was lucky enough to capture of a red knot that has an egg in its bill. And here's a semi-palmated sandpiper that's just picked up an egg. And I like this picture because it also, if you look at the foreground, you'll see a whole bunch of eggs that are on the surface that the bird is picking at. So with this controversy that all of a sudden this unregulated fishery for horseshoe crabs to use as bait for conch, and the birds were heading into a collision course, and the states were a little uncertain what to do and how to handle this, so they approached the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, which is a body, a cooperative management body for all the states on the Eastern seaboard. And they asked them to set up a, a fishery management plan for horseshoe crabs. Um, oh, and I didn't mention, but don't worry about writing all these things down. I, I provided a handout which has these references so that you can go online and, and delve into this. They've got a nice amount of information on the commission's website and also records of their meetings so you can find out what's been going on. Anyway, they got involved around 2000, 1999, I think exactly. And one of the first actions they took was to uh, ask the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to to set up a reserve where there would be no fishing allowed for horseshoe crabs, which they did, which was quite nice. And uh, so you can see the area off the mouth of Delaware Bay, a rather large area where trawl surveying had shown this was the hot spot for horseshoe crabs. Another thing that happened early on in 2014 was my agency, the agency I used to work for, designated the red knot as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Now threatened means that the animal is in is likely to become endangered in the foreseeable future. So it doesn't say it's endangered yet, but it's on that it's on that path and it's likely that it will become so in the future. One of the most interesting things the Atlantic State Marine Fish Commission did was implement an adaptive management framework. And that's a lot of words that may not mean that much to you. So I'm gonna go over it a little bit so you'll have a feel for what it means. Um, what it does is it sets up rules, if you will, for harvest of horseshoe crabs. And it divides horseshoe crabs into females and males. And the females, it says, unless the red knot population is at a large enough abundance level, there's enough red knots that a reasonable person would say, uh, harvesting horseshoe crabs shouldn't be a problem because there's so many red knots, you can't harvest them. And of course, red knots are not at that level. So uh, there's a restriction on harvesting. It also has, it has a two-pronged test though, because you could conceive of a situation in which there's not very many red knots, but the horseshoe crab abundance is such that any reasonable person would say, horseshoe crabs cannot possibly be limiting red knots. And so they have that second test, 1B. And of course, we haven't met that either. So female crabs are not allowed to be harvested anymore. Then for males, what they basically do is say, if there's not enough males to fertilize all the eggs that the females produce, then you can't harvest them. And fortunately for the watermen, there's lots of males in the population. So they do allow a small male harvest. And the way it works is this, you set up a monitoring program for red knots, you set up a monitoring program for horseshoe crabs, those are the, those are the purplish boxes. You learn what you can about Delaware Bay and the shorebird and horseshoe crab population. And then you set up a matrix or set of rules 
that tells you when you can harvest. And then you figure out how to change, how to convert that into harvest allocations for the four states involved. And then you let them harvest. Well, by harvesting, they're affecting the shorebird population and the horseshoe crab population. So each year you monitor it. Each year you look at the decision rules and decide whether and how much you can harvest. And then you let the states harvest and you keep going around in that cycle. So that's all the management part. Where does the ad adaptive come in? Well, the adaptive comes in because our knowledge is imperfect about the ecosystem. And there's three competing ideas about how important Delaware Bay and eggs, horseshoe crab eggs are for the birds. One model in this system says there's no effect. No matter how many horseshoe crab eggs there are, red knots will do fine. And nobody really trusts that one. So that's got very given very little weight. The second model that we're curious about is the fecundity model, which says, well, the eggs are important and they're, the impact of having not enough eggs is that there will be fewer young red knots each year. So that's another one that's being tested at the same time and more weight is given to that one. And then there's a third one that says, well, it's not just how many young red knots are produced, it's also how many adult red knots actually can survive. Because if they can't get enough fat on their body, maybe they can't survive as well. And so we have these three being simultaneously tested. And over time, if you find that the data you're collecting really points you to say this middle one, then you may realize after some period of time that you don't really need this one and you don't really need this one. This is the one that really tells you what you need to know. And that's how you use the adaptive portion of that. At any rate, here's what the data has shown us for the last 10 years that this has been in effect, or 11 years maybe. Uh, so this is the red knot passage population. And it's based on a marked, unmarked recapture analysis, which is pretty standard for estimating population sizes. But what's not so standard is it's an open system. So some birds come earlier, some birds come later, some birds leave earlier, some birds leave later. And so that's where we have the flagged birds with individual markings, which I'll get to in a bit. Um, anyway, this is the population estimate for the last 10 years. And you can see it doesn't really look like it's changed a whole lot. So it's fairly steady. And this is the female male crab, the total crabs and the red knots. And again, on the crab side of the equation, it looks like maybe it's gone up just a little bit, but not anything really dramatic and the red knots seem to be holding their own. And so the harvest, as you might expect because of that, has been a steady state. You can harvest some of the male crab, crabs and that's it, because we're continuing to wait in, in hopes that the horseshoe crab population will increase. And, and this is what the horseshoe crab bait landings look like, as well as the biomedical collection. So you can see that earlier, when the plan was just started, the harvest for horseshoe crabs for bait use was a lot higher than it is now. And it's been relatively low. It bounces around a little bit, but these orange bars you can see have never gone up much. They've just stayed around, bouncing around their uh, level that's been staying about the same. The biomedical collection is the yellowish bars, and you can see how that's gone. And it started out a little bit lower, and as it got to worldwide, it increased and it looks like it's even increasing a little bit more. Now that's just collected. That's not what caught what uh, that's not mortality. So the mortality is estimated at 15% of what's used by the biomedical, and that's these green bars here. And you can see that that's increased a little bit, but again, it's it's fairly low. What I find difficult when I look at the what I've just shown you is that I don't get the context of how much harvesting is going on related to how large the population is. So I always put together a, a chart like this. And on this one, this is the male population estimate. This is the female population estimate for horseshoe crabs. This is just combined, so you add the male and the female. This is the male harvest that is allowed. The female harvest is zero but there's the, the line, they can, you can't see the line unless it's thick enough to see, so, but that should be a zero. And so the combined harvest that's allowed is only as high as the male. 
because zero plus anything is the same. And so you can then compare, well, this is how much we're allowing watermen to take, and this is how big the populations are. Uh, likewise, this is the biomedical collection, about the same as the harvest, except there's not that much mortality. And this is the estimated mortality compared to the harvest or compared to the populations. And I find that helps me when I'm trying to think about these things. Uh, the other survey that, that we found helpful is the Tierra del Fuego, the tip of South America survey that's been going on for quite a while since the late 1900s. And you can see that back in the day, population down there was quite a bit higher, took a sudden decline and, and seemed to be stable for a while and then seemed to take another decline, maybe another decline, but for the last 10 years or so, it's been relatively stable. Uh, so again, suggesting that it's holding, they're holding their own. So in order to continue doing this in an adaptive management way, the state of Delaware runs a shorebird monitoring project that collects the data for uh, the purpose of trying to estimate the passage population. And it's a lot of fun to work on. Uh, when I was working for the US Fish and Wildlife Service, I was heavily involved in this as well as other management meetings and issues. But now that I'm retired, I just do the fun stuff. So I just go down and help them monitor. Um, and what we do is we collect data uh, by going out in the field with spotting scopes and recording the individually marked birds by reading their flags and by doing ratio counts of how many birds are marked versus how many birds are not marked. And the four birds we're focusing on are red knots, ready turnstones, sanderlings, and semi-palmated sandpipers. The red knot, of course, because that's the one that's listed as threatened, also because it's the largest one, and it flies the farthest, and it only feeds on eggs that are at the surface of the sand. So if anything's going to be affected by a lack of horseshoe crab eggs in Delaware Bay, this you would think would be the first bird that you would see that effect in. We also study turnstones as an interesting contrast because turnstones will dig deep into the sand to get at the eggs. And frequently you'll see them digging in a, quite a pit as deep as they are tall and other shorebirds trying to rush in and grab eggs as well. So that gives us a little bit of potential contrast if we uh, can get the funding to do that type of comparative analysis. We also look at sanderlings, and uh, as you're probably aware, they're in uh, both a dark phase and a light phase. Uh, they're more oriented towards the coast, the ocean coast, so they don't come into Delaware Bay as far as red knots do. So the thought was that that might give us another little contrast if we could get the funding to do a comparative study between them. And then lastly, the semi-palmated sandpipers, because they will feed in the mud flats in the tidal marshes, so they're not restricted just to horseshoe crab eggs. Of course, there, we, we're dealing with mixed flocks, so we get lots of dunlin as well, and we put bands on their legs, we just don't put color marks on their, on their legs, and we don't understand them as individuals. And we get a lot of short-billed uh, dowagers, catch a lot of them as well. And we get to see sometimes uh, black neck stilts, which were quite a treat because they're pretty elegant and fun to look at. But what we spend our time doing is looking at bird legs. Um, we're looking for the color markers. This is an example of one. We call them flags. So if I use the word flag, just know that it's a color marker. Um, and in this one, of course, you can see the letter A, the letter L, and the equal sign. And we have to be very intentional about what characters we'll put on there because many characters are confusing, like the number eight and the letter B would be extremely difficult to distinguish between. So we exclude a number of things. And so we have a more limited set of characters than you might think. Anyway, the color of the flag is significant. This is a green flag, although it's got a little yellowish stain from being on the bird for a while. Um, but a green flag tells me that this bird had this flag put on when it was in the United States. And across the Western Hemisphere, there's what we call the Pan-American uh, that 
coordinates who uses what color flags on, in which country. Uh, you can see in the background a white flag, LVN, and that tells me that that bird was flagged or the flag was put on that bird in Canada. Uh, likewise, this orange flag tells me that this bird had the flag put on in Argentina. Uh, the blue one tells me that bird had the flag put on while it was in Brazil. And the red tells me that bird had the flag put on while it was in Chile. And those are the most common ones we find. And so just the color of the flag gives me some information about this bird's whereabouts. Of course, these birds fly up and down the, north, uh, the Western Hemisphere. So uh, any color flagged bird could be seen in any particular country. And uh, what I thought I would do would be share with you a uh, video that I took through my uh, extremely long lens camera that shows you what we're doing when we're sitting here in Miss Billion Harbor, this is, um, and we're scanning across a flock and you'll see some birds that have flags on them. Uh, un unlike what you would do with a spotting scope, I'm not taking the camera and following a single bird to fi finally get to read it. Instead, what I'm doing is more of a ratio scan where I'm saying, ah, I'll count 50 red knots and I'll keep track of how many have flags on them. Um, so what I have to do is stop this share and start a share with the video. Just bear with me for a moment. I'll be right back with this and we will, I'll show you that video. Okay, so that hopefully gives you a feel. It's a little frenetic because of the high magnification, which is what happens to us while we're looking through the spotting scope. So uh, we find that people can, can do this for about three hours at the most, and then their head starts to hurt and they need a break. So we go out in, in teams over the course of a day to do that. Uh, The other part, of course, is that we couldn't have the flags on the birds if we didn't catch them. So another portion of what we're doing is catching birds, um, banding them, and taking some measurements from their bodies. We catch them using what's called a cannon net. You can see the cannon net has gone over the birds, and I'll just point out that uh, the birds have not lifted off. You can see a couple birds up here that have gotten up after the net has already passed but you can see that the bulk of the birds hasn't gotten up. We have to be very careful when we do this that we don't hurt the birds. Um, and so you need a highly trained team and people who really know what they're doing when they're firing cannon nets. This is uh, a cannon. It gets buried in the sand, but right now it hasn't been buried in the sand yet. And uh, here's another picture of a cannon net. Again, uh, you can see the birds have just started to lift off by the time the cannon net has already gone over the birds and then it just settles down on top of them. And so I have another video. Um, how are we doing time-wise? Um, let's see. You can keep going. I mean, okay. 
People can drop out if they need to leave, but yeah, you can keep going. We're fine. Okay. So this is a five minute. I'll, I'll provide some narration. It doesn't have a soundtrack, so you'll know what's going on. Um, but this is a catch that just happened to be caught uh, on our uh, on the nature cam. This is the Mispillion Nature Center, and they have a camera set up, and the camera just happened to be aiming where we were doing a catch, where the team was doing a catch. So, uh, so watch this. The net is here. You can see it's all furled up. You can actually, if you look closely, see the cannon, ends of the cannon. Um, and uh, we're very careful to make sure birds don't get too close to the net, because when it's close to where it was furled, it could hurt the birds. Um, and also, uh, we need to make sure the birds aren't flying, because again, the net being going through the air, there we go. So the net gets fired over the birds, then it settles down, trapping the birds, the birds that got out from under the net uh, have left. Now people are running quickly because you'll see how much the birds are struggling. They can see the sky through the mesh of the net, and so they struggle and can damage their feathers. Uh, while they're trying to figure out a way to fly because they don't realize what they're up against. So what we do is we quickly make sure that the um, birds are in a position where they're going to be relatively comfortable and bring uh, carry boxes. That's what that gentleman has. So we can carry the birds from the net when we extract them all the way back to where we're going to be doing the processing. And in a moment, you'll see the people carrying the covering material. So what we try to do is get the birds covered as quickly as we can. Uh, that big tan tarp that's coming in is going to be opened up and spread out over the net. And what we find is that once the birds are covered by that tarp, then they can't see the sky. They stop struggling and they just sort of sit there waiting to see what's going on. They might walk around a little bit underneath, but they're not in trying to flap their wings and get out from under the net the way they're doing right now. Uh, so these guys will unfurl that um, that what we call covering material, and uh, they'll spread it out. And what we have to do is be careful not to drag it across the, the net, because that will also damage their feathers. So you'll see them carefully stretching it tautly between them and uh, holding it above the net while they get it into position and then just dropping it down after which you'll see people starting to uh, extract birds and put them into the carrying boxes to take up to where our processing will occur. So I'll just let it go a little bit further so you can see that. Sometimes the wind makes it a little difficult uh, and we have to be careful not to step on the net, step on the birds, because that uh, could cause quite a quite an injury and it takes quite a few people. Cannon netting takes quite a large team because of all the equipment and because we're catching so many birds. We will uh, catch anywhere from 100 birds to 1,000 birds quite commonly uh, under a cannon net. It all depends upon the size of the birds and how jammed together they are. Uh, frequently, when they're feeding heavily, they can be quite jammed in and shoulder to shoulder. Uh, so I'll stop it there, get back to the slideshow. Okay, so after we get them out of the net and up to our area where we're going to process them, you can see the nature centers in the background there. This is away from where the birds are feeding. You can see the covering material, a boat that was used to bring all the equipment. We have what we call keeping cages, which are burlap uh, cages where we put the birds in. So they get carried up in the carry boxes, put into here. And once they're in here, they're very comfortable and they're very calm. And it's very easy to hold them for a period of time. We don't want to hold them too long, though, because their job is to go out and eat. And we don't want them under any more stress than they need to. We don't want them overheating. So we put shade over fairly often. And then we'll set people up into teams where they can do sort of an assembly line to process the birds. So one person will be a scribe writing down what everybody tells him. Another person will be putting the band on the bird. Another person will be measuring a wing and so forth. And so what we do is we always put on a metal band, as you probably are aware. Any bird that gets caught typically gets a metal band. But we also put on a color marker or the flag 
so that we'll know this bird as an individual. And you can see this is a turnstone, not a red knot, because the four species that we focus on, we will put color marks on. We also measure them. Uh, we may be measuring wings, head, and bill. Uh, and we also weigh them. And the weighing is particularly important for red knots and birds feeding on horseshoe crab eggs because that gives us some sense for how the population is doing in terms of gaining weight for the, the particular, for a given season. It takes a lot of equipment to do this. It takes a lot of people. So we rely heavily on volunteers and uh, Delaware coordinates the volunteers, the state of Delaware, their fish and wild, wildlife program. And if you're interested in going up to Delaware and spending a few days with us, uh, just check out their website and, and find out what's going on. Even uh, if you're not, you might wanna check out the website to see the training modules. We've developed a number of training modules to help people identify birds, help them understand how to help us with cannon netting, how to help us with reciting. There's also a, uh, a video that was shown on public TV a couple of years ago. Uh, and I have a link on the handout I provided for uh, that video, a meeting of migrations, the director's cut um, by Mike Oates. He's a great uh, videographer who does uh, more um, uh, reporting on what's going on as opposed to anything else. And he's done some really cool videos. Uh, this was one of his latest ones. And uh, if you wanna watch it, I think it's like 30 or 40 minutes long. It's a fun one to watch. If you happen to be up at Delaware Bay and you wanna just go out to the bay in, during May, last half of May is the best time. And you wanna get out onto the beach, there's two places I would recommend. One is Pickering Beach. The other is the DuPont Nature Center and Slaughter Beach. Uh, I recommend them because they both have bathroom facilities and parking and easy access to the beach. At Pickering Beach, it's Porta Johns. You can get out onto the beach in front of the houses and walk up and down, checking out crabs, checking out uh, what birds are there. Unfortunately, in the last five years, we haven't had a lot of red knot use outside of Miss Billion Harbor, which is where the DuPont Nature Center is. Slaughter Beach is also an easy access to the beach, but there's no bathroom facilities. There are bathroom facilities at the DuPont Nature Center. And at the DuPont Nature Center, you can see out from their deck and look across the Miss Billion Harbor, which I should mention is unique on Delaware Bay in that it's protected from the bay, so it's protected from the wind. So because horseshoe crabs are at risk from getting flipped over and dying, they won't spawn if the wave action is too intense. So in, we find in Miss Billion Harbor, more horseshoe crabs spawn under more weather conditions than anywhere else on the bay. And the water warms up faster because it's protected from the bay and it's fed by big massive tidal marshes, expansive tidal marshes. So there's an order of magnitude more eggs available to the birds in Miss Billion Harbor than anywhere else on the bay. But the DuPont Nature Center also has a nature cam which lets you see which was what captured the footage of the cannon net. And uh, so you can be in there and you can see the birds up very close through that camera, even though the nature center is across the bay from where the birds are. So two good places to go if you happen to be down there. Um, if you happen to be in Florida, which you are, and you see a bird, you have a good spotting scope and you can read the, the flag on the bird's leg, you can record, you can report that to bandedbirds.org. And of course they need a fair uh, number of pieces of information, when and where and location and species and the color and the code. Um, but uh, if you wanna check out that site, it's a nice way to report your observations if you happen to do that. You also always have the option, opportunity potentially to see a crab that's been tagged. They have been tagged by my previous my agency, the US Fish and Wildlife Service. The tag has the number for calling it in. Um, all you have to really do is take a picture of the tag as long as it's legible and you can report those as well. And that's uh, really useful information to get. And before uh, the talk, I contacted a colleague of mine, Kevin Kalis. He used to run the, the bird uh, red, red knot monitoring program up in Delaware. 
But then he moved on to other things and he now works for the United States Fish and Wildlife Service down in Florida. And uh, he's uh, working on red knots as well as a whole bunch of other things. And uh, he shared this slide with us for today. Um, he's talking a little bit about how Florida is used by red knots. And you guys are lucky because you get them all year round potentially. Um, some of their threats, red tide being an interesting one that uh, we didn't realize for a while and we need to learn more about, and some of the research that he's been involved with. And if you want to contact him, he gave his uh, email so you can contact him. Um, and he provided a picture of what red knots look like down in Florida, which look quite different than the ones I see because I always have their robin red, best, red breast while I'm look, working on them. And with that, I will end it and uh, entertain questions uh, as long as you guys want to talk about it. I can probably bend your ear. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it was fun. And I hope I uh, taught you something about red knots and horseshoe crabs. Yeah, it was fascinating. We did have some questions. I think one of them got answered. But Terrence Skelton, when you had the video of the cannon, there were a lot of horseshoe crab shells on the beach. Are those the dead horseshoe crab shells? So on the beach, if you come to Delaware Bay during May, you you'll, can see dead horseshoe crab shells, but you can also see a lot of live horseshoe crabs that got overturned by jostling around with other horseshoe crabs, um, or sometimes horseshoe crabs that have just hunkered down to wait. Horseshoe crabs are quite durable critters, and they can uh, sit on the beach waiting for water to come back up to where they are uh, for several days uh, without too much duress. So yes, you can. we frequently are catching where there's a lot of horseshoe crabs. And uh, I've even uh, gotten my knees quite sore extracting birds because I keep kneeling on horseshoe crabs in some places. <laughs> And the DuPont Nature Center that had the view of that, that is open to the public, correct? Correct. They also have an osprey cam too, which is fun to watch. Um, they don't have, they have somewhat limited hours and I think they're only seasonal. So only during May, maybe in early April into June, something like that. If you check their website, uh, you'll be able to uh, check on that before you go. But yeah, I would check their website before you go to make sure they're open. And I want to mention we're, we're going to have two screens up that have your resources. So if someone's interested, they should screenshot this and I'll put the other one up in a minute. Okay. Okay. I think um, Greg, um, a different Greg is asking, can you please repeat the statistics on the status of red knot population? From the slides, it looked like it was relatively stable over the past decade, whereas I thought its population was plummeting. Uh, that's a really good I? question. Yep, thanks for asking. There is um, a, a number of people will point to and are quite concerned about the red knot population. The data for the passage population indicates a fairly stable population over the last 10 years. Now that's lower than what the historic population was, so we're quite concerned. But if you look at the aerial survey, which has been run by uh, New Jersey, um, it has shown some declines. It's also shown some increases, so it's hard to know what to make of it. But there has been a number of uh, news items uh, talking about the concern and the decline in the red knots. So yeah, you can, you can hear both things. Uh -huh. Lots of comments on wonderful presentation, lots of great information. Um, let's see, typically I see red knots, oh me too, at Fort DeSoto Beach in North St. Petersburg. And I think, did you say that a lot of those are the juveniles? Is that what um, my understanding was? No, I think they're just in winter plumage. Oh, okay. So they're kind of hopping back up and forth. Yeah, we've we've uh, some researchers have tried putting geolocators on juveniles, which is quite a trick in itself. Uh, they have to go up into uh, Canada and hope they get some juveniles that are starting to migrate south. But they've been able to do that, and they found a few returns 
from juveniles that suggest that perhaps Cuba is uh, is being used by them as well as the southeastern United States. Um, but we don't really have a strong handle on them. So I would guess that you are probably not seeing them in Florida, just seeing the winter plumage adults. Mm. Um, another question from Terrence, are female horseshoe crabs harvested for the biomedical, the blood draws, I think you called them? Yes, uh, as far as I know, they're harvesting both male and female. Um, I, I would just, take issue with the word harvest because generally people think of harvest as you collect them for and kill them. Whereas the biomedical is collecting them, but not killing them, just withdrawing some of the blood and then returning them to the sea. And while we know there is some mortality associated with that, the bulk of them seem to be doing okay. Um, Terry was wondering, are there surveys in their winter grounds in South America? Yes. Uh, so the Tierra del Fuego survey uh, has been going on for quite a number of years, and I had a graph up of that. Uh, the um, Florida winter survey has not been very consistent, so we don't have a, a good consistent data for many years for that. And the northern Brazil area is the other wintering area for red knots. And again, we don't have very many survey years from that. So it's hard to know what's happening with Florida and Brazil. Uh, Florida is also interesting because my guess would be that the birds are probably using Florida and Georgia because these are birds that will fly far, far, very far at the drop of a hat. Um, some researchers have even suggested they will fly during high tide flood events as a way of roosting, that they'll just keep flying until the tide goes out again and they can land and start feeding again. And I don't know if that's true, but it sounds pretty impressive. So I, it would be surprising if, if red knots stayed just in one localized area in Florida and didn't move around a lot as resources suggested they, to them that they should. Okay, and there, the com why for the hunting commercially is that for the fertilizer industry continuing for, or horseshoe crabs were collected for fertilizer at one time in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, and then that stopped. Now horseshoe crabs are collected to use as bait to catch another animal called conch. Um, and as far as red knots, back in the days of market hunting, they were collected and sent into like Boston and other places for food, but we don't do that anymore. And in fact, they're now listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. So you're not even supposed to be out there disturbing them. Good. <laughs> um, another question from Terrence Skelton. My nephew lives in Delaware. He would probably love to volunteer on this. What site does he go to to find out the information for this? Uh, all he needs to do is go to the Delaware Shorebird Project, if you could show that top one up there, and uh, then he'll find out, he'll find a page that says how to volunteer and a contact, and he can contact that person and uh, let them know he's interested in volunteering. They're always interested in volunteer, volu more volunteers. So yeah, just let them know. Right. We have about, I think it's about 30 to 40 volunteers over a season. Okay, and I think Alex said, what use did red knot serve to be hunted by humans? I think you kind of just went over that though. So I think it was the earliest was what the fertilizer and then it was for um, bait. Any other uh, uses? Well, horseshoe crabs were used for fertilizer and later for, and now for bait. Yeah. Red knots, were uh, harvested in during the market hunting era. And uh, as far as I know, they were eaten. So back in the day, uh, you know, people shot lots of birds and ate them. Um, you, you probably have plenty of records of that for various birds. And uh, red knots apparently were a highly desirable food resource for hunters who like to go out on the coast and, and shoot shorebirds. Hmm. 
Oh, Terrence wants to know what time of year is the volunteer project? It's uh, the the monitoring program is starts in early May and ends uh, the first week of June, uh, basically when the birds are in town. Very good. Any more questions? Looks like we are finished. All right. Excellent program. Very interesting. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. It was fun to do. I'm glad uh, maybe I'll get to meet some of you when I come down to visit Terry next time. That's right. You got to go birding. Yeah. That's right.